place for the Mardi Gras fish. This will be in the main hall along with the good old Seabird. There's one heavy speaker. And these are speak speakers. Speakers that Kenneth actually had in the joint. Wasn't it Seabird who uh, did naked poetry performances in the 1960s? And I believe they kept doing them for some time thereafter. In fact. Huh. Do, uh, he would they'd come out in leotards, you know, and uh, do this rather innocuous uh, poetry reading with strumming guitars and. Next thing they'd come out with uh, candles in hand and uh, finish their poetry performance naked. I think it was the Seabirds. I think they made some documentary films too. Well, we got another monster hanging. Uh, the leaves are. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I almost got a few people today. That'll show up in Texas Chainsaw Massacre <laughs> 7. Hey, what's next, bro? Meat hook. Fish hook. You shoot like this nowadays. It's, it's called Nouveau oh, Cinematography. Oh, yeah, just always moving and wiggling around, yeah. I've seen several videos like that lately where they're just like. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> What goes up there? Is there a little troll that lives up in there? <laughs> well, there's real, uh, real conduit and uh, real wiring in there now. We took it out from Kenneth. The ceilings were actually uh, cardboard, up there. and they were uh, so many leaks in the roof. They were all just kind of bowed down floor was falling through, a tree growing out on one side of it. And it was, uh, the, lock, the wiring was done for the 1930s. I've been trying to run all this neon and everything. And it was, but each time we've had a reason to renovate, there's been a big boost to the electrical. And finally, it was like, well, we passed the electrical inspection. I guess we finally got it done. Fire inspector and all. We strung out. Extension cords to extension cords, and Eddie wanted the whole thing covered in neon with only like about six electrical outlets. <laughs> it was nuts. At one point, came in and felt like the whole thing was a listing ship. There must have been 20 neons all in the one corner around the bar area. It was the only place that had electricity, and nothing else throughout the rest of the building. <laughs> I don't know what the electrical, what the uh, fire inspector is so worried about. I mean, you know, we burned down twice and got it back together. So, well, when Kenneth and Janice were playing here uh, or earlier on, I mean, when it reached its heyday was just shortly, really after Janice performing here. Uh, Pal St. John was around and uh, the Water Creek Boys and various things, uh, Stan Alexander and the university students were coming in. And this was Thread Gill's music venue. I mean, from this back counter, this bar, the front door, the window was there, the jukebox was there, the front door came in under the open the gas bay out there, and um, you had a, stools along here and a couple of tables, and this was Thread Gill's. Um, I, mean, I don't know, it was packed at like 30 people. Uh, everybody was just wedged in. Kenneth never had a key to Thrails. He never locked it. And uh, he lived on site. His house was in the back, which is where he did his moonshine back before he got his liquor license. And um, 
the fire marshal, again the fire marshal, the fire marshal came in and gave me the ultimatum. There were so many people trying to crowd in and so many people packed into it at the time. The fire marshal's ultimatum was, you know, either lock the doors and turn people away or close it down. And Ken said, I don't even have a key to lock it up, so he just closed it down and that was where it sat fallow and the Janus sang here was sprayed on it at that point and, uh, until Eddie reactivated it again, 7980. How long did it sit here? Probably seven years. There was a transient living in it. There was a tree growing out of one side of it. Kenneth had just actually used the beer signs more as a way to patch holes in the walls and the ceiling. <laughs> it was a cheap way to conceal the leaks and all. But um, there was a transient in it. So after acquiring it, it's starting the looking it over for uh, renovations. The, uh, the transient aggravated it being uh, dispelled from the place torched the building, so we started initially with a, a burned building, and uh, it was just after the diner was built, the weekend the diner opened, I guess, um, that a disgruntled fired employee uh, stayed over, hid in the bathroom, stayed over at the closing of a, a long holiday weekend stole the cash receipts and torched the building from the center where the liquor cabinet and the uh, safe was. And it was the second loss of the place, or fire in the place. The interesting thing, which I don't know if that goes on record or not, is that, you know, all, all the buildings are inset off of Lamar here, uh, parallel with these buildings on either side of us here. Um, to allow for, I guess, for future expansion of the road. And when we looked at, after the fire, at uh, rebuilding the building, if you were to rebuild here, you would have to comply. You had to move the building and replace it back at the, the new um, access here. So, and we didn't want to lose that. We didn't want to leave our, lose our frontage right here on Lamar. It's all he grandfathered in. So, the entire building was jacked up off the ground, put on braces and stilts. The slab was poured under it, and the building taken back down one wall at a time and virtually replaced in the process until the, the roof and the front gas bay area was about the only original structure after that. Um, but we were able to keep it in its, uh, in its original footprint and we used many of the original materials, although <clears throat> disappointingly there really wasn't much to uh, the structure by the time it was acquired from Kenneth. Um, years of uh, neglect and decay and been sitting fallow for a long time, trees growing through it and transients and stuff, it took its toll on it. So it's been a labor of love on Eddie's part to just Keep the footprint, let the ghosts have a playground, and they still got the same place they can come back to, I guess. Uh, and keep it pretty much in the character and in, and under the uh, direction that uh, Kenneth would like it to be. Kenneth was quite a character. I mean, I, I never realized I did a lot of get to know him through all his artifacts and everything. <laughs> One of the funny things about Kenneth. We, we, this is huge safe, uh, big, thick cast iron safe, 12 inch wall, it's a little small close up. <laughs> and we had no, no uh, combination for the lock. We had the, the safe hoisted with a crane, we built the museum banquet room in the back, hoisted to the second floor and put into the building. And uh, got cockers out here for the locksmith to uh, bust the code and open the safe. So we had a momentous Geraldo Rivera moment when we opened the Thread Gill safe. The safe was empty, except for Kenneth's teeth. His original uh, 
teeth. He wore dentures there at the end, so he had, he had saved his teeth. That was all. He had a value, I guess. Uh, he's a character. He was. There's some photos of him around. Where's that piece? So there's a piece over there that showed him and Millie, his wife, uh, who's his high school sweetheart, uh, standing in front of a uh, Model A Ford and looking just like uh, 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 Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, incredibly, I mean, uh, well dressed. Both of them very picturesque. Kenneth was very handsome. Kenneth, Kenneth was valedictorian in his class. He was voted most likely to succeed, but somewhere along the way, he got exposed to music and, and, and booze <laughs> and uh, changed his course and decided to be a music entrepreneur and uh, a yoga. Room. And thus been derailed. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but he did see the photo of him. It's a, oh, 